While I was browsing Craigslist one day for fun to see if I could find some good deals, I came across the listing for a collection of some homebrew equipment. Can you guess how much I paid for all of this pictured here? Greensandmachines.com So what have I done to upgrade my brew house on the cheap, and what was the first beer I brewed using it? Well first let's take a look back at some of the previous brew house setups I've used. Starting out brewing in college, my roommates and I, we set out to find the biggest and cheapest large kettle that we could find locally. We ended up finding an 8 gallon aluminum kettle. Every time we'd use that thing, we'd find some new place the aluminum would oxidize, but there's no big problem with that. So we did extract for a bit before we decided, hey, let's move up to all grain and save a little money. And we ended up building a mash tun out of five gallon buckets. And it was a pretty nice setup. We had five gallon all grain going in college. We were, it was pretty good with our friends. They loved the beer. Being that there were three of us brewing together, splitting the brew three ways, it was a really good excuse to brew more often because that beer would go really fast. But, you know, that mash tun is really good. And if you're interested in seeing more about it and how to build it, click the link in the top right corner of the screen. So that old brew house I ended up giving to one of my other roommates because at that time I couldn't bring that brewery with me. It was too big. You know, it was sad to see it go for the memories it had, for how useful it was for the delicious beer. But it was time to move on, time to grow up. And eventually, now I'm at my new house, I wanted to brew again anyway. I go over to Walmart and I buy probably the most efficient kettle I could use for one gallon batches. And that was a three gallon kettle. It only cost me like $11, but you know, it was perfect and I could do all grain. So the way I ended up doing all grain at that house is I took the brew in a bag method. So I had a five gallon bucket. I put that in the backyard, lined that with a paint strainer bag, and into that bag went all the grain and all the hot water, and I'd wrap it in a blanket. And you know, it worked pretty well, like the mash efficiency was pretty good. And then I just put it in the kettle and boil inside. You know, this house I ended up sharing with like five other random strangers I met on Craigslist, so I'd just brew one day, be quick in the kitchen, clean up immediately, otherwise some note would get left for me. Like, hey, clean up your stuff in the kitchen, that's wonderful, but you know. I was still able to make good beer at that house, even though it was on the one gallon scale, and I developed some of my better recipes down the line. So at this point, I'd been nearly a year out of school, and I had gotten another job, and it was time to move again. So this new house, luckily, compared to the last one, I had a lot more freedom to operate. So I could upgrade my meager home brewing setup that I had from the previous house. There are some design considerations though, since the stove inside this house was still not large enough to fit a giant 8 gallon kettle on it. So I ended up buying a 4 gallon kettle of similar quality and price to that the 3 gallon one I had already owned. So if I was going to do a 5 gallon batch to do my boils, I would need to split the wort between the two kettles. Half in one, half in the other. And at this point I was still doing the brew in a bucket method, but at some point I became not so happy with it and I wanted to do some higher gravity brews. There just happened to be an igloo cooler that one of my roommate's friends had abandoned in the backyard after a river trip they had went on. Guess what became my new mash tun? So a quick overview of how it worked. I took some CPVC and built a manifold out of it. That served as a false bottom between the grain and the wort. The wort filtered through this manifold through a bulkhead fitting and valve. Which you controlled the flow of wort from the mash tun into your kettles. So you could see nothing could absolutely go wrong having this new mash tun, right? Well, no, that's not true. Aside from the fact that there was no temperature control, which isn't really a big deal, but because it was much larger than that five gallon bucket, you need a much larger grain bill to get the wort volume high enough to cause the siphon effect to happen inside the mash tun. So this wasn't a big problem with big brews using 14 pounds or more of grain for five gallon batch. But if you're making a light beer that used 10 pounds of grain for a five gallon batch, well, you're not gonna fill up that whole mash tun. The only time I did it, this resulted in making a 10 gallon batch of this one brew 
And that came out pretty good regardless, but it was a lot of beer and it really slowed down production because I had to do two different sub lots of boiling and spent twice as long in the kitchen boiling late wort. So this was my homebrew setup through the next two houses I lived in and where I am now. Guess it became time to become a big boy brewer and get a giant kettle and external propane burner. So back onto the main story itself on how this brew house got updated off the cheapest Craigslist brewery I could find. Here is the listing and here's what I ended up picking up from this guy. I got one keg converted into a boil kettle with a propane burner. One immersion chiller, which I've never had before, and I'd been cooling off my kettles by just submerging them into the sink with ice. So we got four kegs from this two, all of them five gallons except one, which is two and a half gallons. Two of them were pin lock and two of them were ball lock. And we also got three glass carboys, that was a big ticket item from that. And we had another bunch of oddments like wart thieves, hydrometers, some literature, but wow, it was quite the haul. I had a really hard time fitting it all in my car. So how much do you think I paid for all this? $300? Nope, too high. $200? Still too high. If you guessed $100, you're right. Yes, I paid $100 for all this. That was as good as highway robbery in my eyes. But of course, there were a few things missing to make this setup all complete. To use the kegs, I would still need to build a kegerator, and by the time I'm making this video, I still had not done that yet. The boil kettle also needed a valve to properly function, so I ordered a few stainless valves off somewhere on the internet, and I slapped one of them on the kettle, and I slapped the other one onto that mash tun itself to replace the brass valve that was currently on there. That cost about $20 for that. I also needed to buy a propane tank to actually use my propane burner, so that was a good $45 or something. I'm in about $165 at this point. To make this deal even sweeter, since I really hate fermenting in glass, I ended up listing two of those carboys back onto Craigslist itself, and I sold those for $30 a pop. So now I'm only in about $105. $105 for all those kegs, a propane burner, and a boil kettle. Can you believe that? Unbelievable. Okay, with that history lesson aside, let's brew some beer. So for today's brew, we are doing a 10 gallon batch of Dunkelweizen. I was collabing with a coworker, and we were going to split the batch 5 gallons a piece. Here's the grain bill. Now the layout of my brew house is fairly linear. In the kitchen, the older kettles that I have lying around heat the mash water prior to the mash, and the sparge water after mashing in. For this brew, it was about 6 gallons worth of mash water and 10 gallons worth of sparge water. While I was waiting for that water to heat, it was time to test out my new toys. The burner lit up with no problem, even though I nearly burnt my hand. There was a loose flare fitting on the wort chiller, but I tightened that down to stop the leak before putting that thing to work. I wouldn't want hose water fouling up my batch after boiling it. Mashing in was pretty straightforward. After adding in the calculated amount of water, the grain was slowly poured in. It took a few minutes due to the sheer quantity, but it made it all in the mash tun. That sat for about 90 minutes while we were off to heat the sparge water and watch some football. Once the 90 minutes was up, the wort was drained into the buckets. When the water in the cooler had dropped below the grain bed level, sparge water was carefully added in over the grain. I should emphasize, carefully. After collecting the wort, it was time to fire up the burner. Now you can see it's a lot easier adding the wort to the kettle once it's on the burner, as it's very heavy otherwise when full. Setting up the regulator to get this wort to a vigorous boil, and we're off. So this beer isn't very hoppy, and there's only one hop addition. That happens at the beginning of the boil. We let this boil go for 60 minutes before starting the cool down and throwing the immersion chiller in to get that started. 
The chiller did its job and it was quick. Took about 25 minutes to bring the wort down to a low enough temperature to drain it into our fermenters. With the wort drained, it was time to get the yeast pitched, and the yeast took off. So we overfilled our fermenters a bit, so we noticed blow off the next day, but nothing happened to the beer. A few more weeks, it bottled it out, and here's the end result. Delicious. The taste was very smooth with a slight bite from the rye malt. This is one I would do again some other time in the future. Hey, thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe to Greens and Machines on YouTube. Don't forget to visit our website at www.greensandmachines.com. Till next time.